Greetings. Good morning. Good morning. We are absolutely thrilled to be here. As winter approaches, we are glad to be able to gather. Unfortunately, Dr. Metzger is not able to join us for some health reasons, and she's asked me to be here in her stead. I'm Dr. Stephen D. Collins, and I'm an assistant professor for, interp for the interpreting department. And we are thrilled to have you here. We have a few announcements before we get started. We want to thank a number of people for this series, the Department of Interpretation, also the Center for Advancement of Interpreting and Translation Research, and the Gallaudet University Regional Interpreter Education Center, or G-U-R-I-E-C. So we want to give sincere thanks to our three sponsors. This is our second of the series this year, and it is a national and international level colloquia. We are very pleased to offer this to you. I'd like to share with you our future presenters for the colloquia series, and we have Jack Hosa with us on Friday, March 4th. And then we have Laura Swaby on April 15th. And she's going to talk about Healthcare, and those are our offerings in the second semester, and we're very excited about those. I would like to invite the Gallaudet University Regional Interpreter Education Center, Bev Holra, the director, to come up and share some words with us. Good morning, everybody. Welcome. I'm happy you were all able to join us today. I'd like to talk to you a little bit uh, about this year in the grant that we have received from the Department of Education through RSA. Those monies is what allows us to host this type of series. We believe that it is very important to disseminate research and make sure that people are familiar with the most recent studies that are taking place. We're very proud to be part of this. It is not something that occurs very often. So we understand the importance of this. Our grant is a five-year cycle, and we're going to be reapplying again. And in this particular year, the RSA um, was added to a previous grant. This is our sixth year. We're very lucky to have that additional support. And we are going to be able to add four more lectures this year. Thank you. The Gallaudet University Regional Interpreting Education Centers exist to improve the skills and quality of interpreters throughout the nation and in our regions. We are also a member of the National Consortium of Interpreter Education Centers. And with them, we work on a national level to accomplish our missions. Again, thank you so much for coming. I know you are going to enjoy the presentation today. Our group that we brought to you today I have to tell you, I've had a sneak peek at their presentation, and it's absolutely stellar foundational work. So welcome, and thank you again. So let me explain the structure of this morning. We will have the presentation, and once that is over, we will be inviting Dr. D Val Dively uh, forward to uh, give a formal response. And then we'll head off to the reception. I'd like to introduce two very important people, uh, Juniper Sussman and Jackie Lightfoot. They are our interpreters for today, so thank you for that. Okay, without further ado, let us go ahead and invite our presenters. We are joined by Dr. Brenda Nicodemus. And she is an associate professor in a researcher and the director of CAITR. And we are joined also by Dr. Petita, and she joins us from Italy. She is a visiting researcher and scholar 
and she looks specifically at uh, interpreting in Italy and Italian Sign Language. And we also are joined by Mark Halley, uh, who is also a researcher and a student. And they are presenting to us, this is the sign for interpreting metalinguistic references and discourse. Thank you and welcome. Good morning and thank you all so much for joining us on this occasion. Certainly appreciate you being members of the audience and also for those who are joining us in a remote vehicle, our regards in particular to Keith Cagle and Cynthia Roy. We want to talk with you today about a topic that the three of us have been contemplating, chewing up, spitting out, trying to digest for quite some time, at least over the last year, we've been giving some serious thought to it. So we want to throw you some of the initial concepts that we have come up with in this field known as metalinguistics. It's a very important topic it arises frequently within the interpreting constructs. So we're going to show you some examples that we feel sure you'll resonate with very quickly. In terms of our overview, let me reflect what we are aiming to accomplish today. First, I'll go through some of the background surrounding metalinguistics in terms of what it means and a brief history of why it appeals to the three of us in our investigations. I'll then hand over to Mark. He will talk you through five particular uh, categories or references of metalinguistics and expand upon them. We will also show you some video excerpts from studies that we have under undertaken where we look at real interpreters in situ with live scenarios and the challenges on a metalinguistic level that arise therein. Julia will then take over to talk through some of the results that we have obtained to date. We will then conclude with some final remarks about our conclusions to date and hand over to Dr. Dively for her response, at which point it will also be an opportunity for all of you to ask questions should you choose to. I'd like to open the concept of our discussion today of metalinguistics in terms of what it is. It's a basic foundational element. When we think about language, if we look at a sign, for example, what we tend to do is look at an individual unit. So that is one thing we can do in a spoken or a signed language. That said, we can look at two different aspects of examination, one being the phonology of that unit, which is basically the form, the manner in which it's constructed. So it might be handshape, movement, location, etc. for a signed unit. And it might be the phonetic representation of how it's spoken, how it's uttered in a spoken reference. So the phonology in and of itself is about the form. It doesn't have any semantic meaning attached yet. But that then leads us to the semantics. What is the meaning of that particular unit or utterance? What's its function? What's it trying to accomplish in that language element? So that's the semantic side. Usually you see the phonology and the semantic element at the same time within the same unit that's uttered. That's how it arises in everyday conversation. They're usually paired and they lead to understanding. However, every now and then, what may come up, come up in discourse is a separation of phonology versus semantic. So an element of phonology and how it's described might come up in everyday discourse when people say, hang on, what's the sign for this particular concept? How do you sign that particular concept? Then we're not looking at the semantics, we're simply looking at the phonology, we're simply looking at the form. So as I said, sometimes phonology and semantics are separated. The difficulties that lie within that separation are what we're going to talk about today. That separation is metalinguistics. So we will have several examples for you in English and in American Sign Language to clarify our definitions here. So 
So in English, we can look at the concept of dog and how it's represented in the phonetic alphabet, which is in the yellow circle you can see on the left. That represents how it's spoken. And then we can see on the right hand side, the actual creature that we love and adore and like to pet, also representing dog. Now let's look at what that linguistic unit looks like represented in American Sign Language. The semantic element is the same, it's the same creature, but the phonemic construction in American Sign Language is different to that seen in English. So again, when we separate the <coughs> phonemic construction from the semantics, this is what we're looking at. So I'm going to give you some examples from what you might come across in your interpreting work. I'm fairly sure these are going to be frequent occurrences, as I said earlier, with which you resonate. So suppose, for example, you are uh, going to interpret for a deaf nurse who is going to speak to an audience. The audience is expectant mothers. She's going to talk them through the birthing process. Now the goal of this deaf nurse is to be friendly, warm and engaging to uh, connect with her audience while giving them this important information. So she introduces herself in a fairly standard way and it looks like this. You might have seen this. So the interpreter at the microphone at the ready sees the signed in, uh, information come at her that looks like, hi, my name is Angie and my name sign is, at which point the interpreter needs to make a decision, right? So that's, therein lies the question that we are examining. We could look at the phenolo phonological elements of the name sign that she's giving. But there is no specific semantic element here. We could describe the handshape and say thumb and forefinger together on the cheek. We could give some cultu <coughs> cultural information. We don't know who the audience is. Maybe they wouldn't understand that. So the interpreter may have a different decision. Possibly, the interpreter says, my name sign is Angie, and my, my name is Angie, and my name sign is the finger, thumb and forefinger on the cheek with a twisting motion. Or that interpreter may say, uh, and along, this, along the same lines of a name in English, in deaf culture, deaf people name themselves in some visual way that references their particular characteristics and elaborate on that kind of a, of a topic, on that kind of description. They may ask the uh, deaf person to repeat the name sign when they get to that point in the interpretation. There are several ways in which this might be handled. Maybe the interpreter says, my name is Angie, and doesn't talk about the name sign element until later in the presentation when the nurse says, remember earlier when I told you about my name sign, let me elaborate on that, at which point the interpreter whose initial decision might have been to not discuss the name sign now has a different metalinguistic issue that arises. So all of these things happen in the moment, live, and the interpreter has to make decisions on strategies to solve immediate metalinguistic problems that arise. And as I'm sure you uh, would agree, these happen on a frequent basis in our regular practice. So as I've said, these are f make frequent appearances in conversation. It might be that someone approaches you and says, how do you sign Germany, right? Then they're asking us about a sign. They're not talking about the country. They're not saying you know, the schnitzels, etc., that occur in Germany. They're asking about how the English word Germany is conveyed in sign language. So they're asking about a phonological form, a phonological construction. You might see the opposite. You might see a deaf person come up and say, the, the sign that we gloss as train gone, how do you translate that into English? What's the English equivalent? Again, they're not talking about the concept per se. They're talking about how the phonological representation in ASL would be presented in English. You might see the phrase, 
like I just said, two heads are better than one. So when you're looking at dialogue, sometimes it's about a f- more of a frozen quote, like two heads are better than one. And as the interpreter, again, we need to make a decision on whether we go for a free interpretation or we maintain the form of that original utterance. If it's going to arise later in the, in the conversation, maybe we may maintain form. If we choose not to maintain form and it does re- reappear, we've got a different set of decisions to make. So we're making those decisions on an instant live basis. Then there's this fourth example about pronouns. Maybe the description is on nouns versus pronouns or verbs versus pronouns and we say he, she and it are pronouns. We're not talking about any individual male or female who's then referenced as a pronoun. We're simply talking about the terms and how they're used. Again, metalinguistics. Looking at everyday dialogue and how language is used to describe it. So as I said, these are some of the challenges as interpreters we face in our daily practice. So in sum, the basic definition of metalinguistics is when we leverage the language to talk about the language. And that's kind of interesting and challenging for us as interpreters. But we contemplate the tools we have. Different industries in the world come up with all manner of examples. So biologists, for instance, may look at cells. And what tools do they use? They use microscopes slides, etc., separate from the language itself, but it lets them uh, explore the cells. So they use a microscope as a tool to examine cells within that field. Think about a pilot. They don't use the plane itself to run the plane. They use various uh, dashboards and controls, etc., to run the plane. And yet we, as interpreters, have a slightly different scenario. Our language is the tool, and our target is the language. Hence the difficulty with separation and analysis of metalinguistics, and that's why it can be a challenge for our work. We thought it would be a good idea to give you just a little history on how the concept of metalinguistics arose. Back in around the 14th century, medieval times, they would have monks who gathered together. They had a lot of time on their hands and conversations would ensue. They started talking about particular language constructions, the function of language. And they came up with ideas that we call syllogisms. A syllogism is the development of an argument where the first two arguments connect to the third in some way. And the third is supposed to make sense based on the premise contained within the first two. Sometimes they do make sense, sometimes not so much. So in this example, mouse is a word. This is true. Words don't eat cheese. This is also true. Therefore, mice don't eat cheese. Hmm. It's a little silly, and yet there is a stream of logic there that ought to make sense. If A and B are true, therefore C ought to be true. But this is the kind of thing that monks use to entertain their time, looking at language, and again, separating the phoneme, phonemic construction from the semantic. So within a lot of languages, we enjoy language play. Sometimes the bane of interpreters is that very word play when, for example, a hearing presenter says, oh, I've got a great pun for you. Really, the bane of an interpreter's existence. It's a hearing thing, right? And yet, these puns may arise, again, with separation between phoneme and semantic meaning. So there may be a lot of these that you know. Some famous jokes, for example, about the deaf man who gets to the railway crossing, right? And the arms are down, so he can't get across. 
He gets out of the car, goes up to the engineer and says, please, but. You've seen that, right? It looks like he's signing, please, but. The engineer doesn't understand what he's saying. Now, the people who understand sign language understand the pun behind this. He wants the, the guard gates to be railed. He doesn't mean the word, but. However, culturally, when you... Uh, when the semantics and phonemes are bound, you see a different sense of play than when you unbind them. Now what's written on this slide we know to be true. Two languages don't exactly parallel one another. There is not 100% interlinguistic correspondence. So there's that element first. Then there's our particular work as sign language interpreters because the phonology doesn't match either. You could hear something in one language and translate it into another spoken language with less difficulty than some of the challenges that we face, which means we have additional strategies at play to bring in to represent two modalities of phonology as well as two sets of semantics. So we've already discussed the fact that the phonology doesn't match between a signed and spoken language. That's one set of issues that may need to be resolved. There is also another where interpreting is concerned, which is lag time. Interpreters need to be somewhat behind to see or hear the utterance before they can render it, right? So if we look back at our example of Angie, the nurse, she says, hi, my name is Angie and this is my name sign. We're a little behind in the interpretation, so we may get to, hi, my name is Angie, and have already decided to eliminate the element about my name sign is. So if we wanted to reference her name sign, we can't because she's already produced the sign and gone on to the next thing. So it's not synchronous. So these kinds of details we need to explore in terms of the phonology of where that name sign is produced and how lag time impacts it. So again, that's a different problem for us that we can look for assistance with. So at this stage, I hope you have a basic understanding of the topic that the three of us have been ruminating on over the last year or so in terms of how it comes up in the workplace, what it looks like. I'm going to hand over to Mark now to talk about the references within metalinguistics and the categories that we've come up with for how they are revealed and what they look like in the work. Mark. Thank you, Brenda, for providing such a nice overview uh, so that we all understand uh, metalinguistics and also the challenges that we've been looking at specifically. So let's go ahead and talk about how some of these interpreters are dealing with these cha challenges. We have identified five different areas. The first one or five different types of metalinguistic references. The first one is autonomy, which is basically a reference to the word to itself. It may be something as simple as the English word dog. The English word dog is dog, and of course we're referring to the word dog and not the actual creature. Another example may be the term slowly. We know it as an adverb. And if we have a sentence that says a person was walking slowly. So the concept of slowly is an adverb. We're not talking about slowly being used as an adverb in that sentence. We're not talking about a person who is walking slowly. We're simply saying that slowly in and of itself is an adverb. The second type of reference is called discourse.
which is a reference to something that was said earlier in the discourse. Let's say you're interpreting for a business meeting as an example. And somebody says, if I scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. And as an interpreter, perhaps they decide to drop form and they sign the concept, if you help me, I'll help you. And then the meeting proceeds. Later in the meeting, however, somebody says this. And there the interpreter is presented with a challenge. There are two challenges in particular. One is the interpreter needs to recall the decision they made before and how it was presented. And if they chose to drop form, it, it's not funny anymore, right? It's hard to make the point here and the interpreter has to figure out how to convey that. At that point, the language and the form and the phonetic form becomes the focus and it is a reference to a previous statement in the discourse. The third type of metalinguistic reference we call technical. <coughs> and we know that interpreters work in a number of different fields, each of them having their own very technical terms. For example, in the linguistics field, we see terms like morphology, and we see terms like syntax. And in the political fields, we see terms like filibuster, and or lame duck. And we know that each of these terms have very specific meaning within their given fields. And for us as interpreters, we are challenged by understanding how those things hold meaning in each of those different types of settings and technical languages. The fourth type of reference we call interaction. And we can see this quite frequently. This is where a participant may try to engage with the interpreter. And we often see questions asked like, how long have you known sign language or been an interpreter? We call this a metalinguistic reference because it's not in the source text. It's something outside and around it, and the interpreter still has to make some decisions about how to address it. So this is why we've included it here in our metalinguistic references. The last type of reference we call independent. And this is where we see the interpreter who might be making a comment about the language itself and not necessarily meaning. As an example, Julia, who's from Italy, if she were to speak in English and I were to interpret, I might let the audience know that she has a strong Italian accent. And again, that is a statement about the language itself, and it's a statement about the form. And this can be a number of things that the interpreter may notice about the language and bring forth for the participants. So we've talked about the metalinguistics and we've seen the types of challenges that come, that come forth and we've also talked about the references. So this led to our research question. How do expert ASL English interpreters manage metalinguistic references in monologic and dialogic settings? What strategies do they employ? And we conducted a study to answer the question.
The first study looked at monologic settings. This is an image from a video we found uh, in the public archives at Gallaudet University. This is from a video of a lecturer who is a teacher. And her presentation is about how to teach deaf children how to read and write. The audience is both deaf and hearing participants, and most of them are educators. The lecturer is presenting most of her material in English, however, occasionally she would present the material in ASL. Regardless of whether she did present in English or ASL, the interpreter interpreted in the uh, according direction. Again, the video is public. However, we went ahead and decided to, out of respect, to go ahead and mask the face of the interpreter here. Some of you may be familiar with Elon, which is a linguistic annotation software. And so what we do is download the video into the software, and then Elon can go ahead and code it. We were looking for metalinguistic references whenever they occurred, and that would be documented and tallied. And then we also looked at how the interpreters responded to and managed each of those metalinguistic references. In this video, uh, it lasted about 90 minutes, and we found 48 references, and those were documented and analyzed. At this point, what we're going to do is we're going to have Julia come up and share with you the findings and results of that study. Thanks, Mark. Almost jumped ahead on the slide there. So through our analysis, we looked at what interpreters do to manage these 48 metalinguistic references that arose in the text. Let's see what strategies they employed. The presenter, as we said, gave the presentation predominantly in spoken English there are times when an ASL sign came up as well. So, the interpreters sometimes fingerspelled the original English word, sometimes described it in English or in sign language, sometimes gave the sign again that the presenter had shown. They also pointed at objects, which in this case was the PowerPoint that was displayed behind. The interpreter was able to turn and reference the, the place on the PowerPoint that was being discussed. And then the last thing on our list we have termed multiple. And that is when the interpreter's strategy incorporated two or more of these elements at the same time to deal with a particular reference. Now let's look at some of the numbers. There were two strategies employed by the interpreters most often. When a particular English word was referenced, the interpreter's preference was to fingerspell it or to show a, a sign that referenced that semantic meaning. If the presenter gave it gave a sign in ASL, the interpreter would either would would generally copy that sign the same sign used. There were seven instances of multiple strategies being used. Let's look at that a little further. The interpreter could 
finger spell and simultaneously point at the object on the PowerPoint. They could finger spell and give a sign for that concept. They could show a sign for the concept and point at it. Or they could finger spell it and show a sign while also referencing the object. So that's a couple of different options on multiple strategies. Three of them that had two strategies and one that employed three strategies at the same time. So of those seven combinations, there was a preference by the interpreters to fingerspell and point. That occurred four times within our data set. So in sum, for the monologic setting, fingerspelling seemed to be the default strategy to express an English word. Where multiple strategies were employed, there were combinations of pointing, fingerspelling and signing. So now let's look at what a dialogue or a dialogic setting looks like. Mark, I'll hand it over to you. We thought that the first study produced a lot of information for us. But we wanted to know how all of this might apply to a dialogic setting. So we essentially conducted a similar experiment. We had a deaf actor who acted as somebody who was teaching somebody a technical program on a computer and were acting like this person here doesn't know sign language, who's actually me. So again, I go in acting as if I know nothing and I'm going in there to learn a computer program. This is the scenario here. Uh, this was, uh, you know, not a heavily scripted environment. This was pretty natural, but we did go ahead and identify some specific metalinguistic references that we wanted to take place so that we could see how the interpreter would respond to each of those references. Each of these trainings ran between 15 and 20 minutes, and we videotaped it. We videotaped 10 different interpreters. And we have begun the analysis. Of those 10 interpreters, we have analyzed six of them. And what we'd like to do is share with you our findings to this date. We're going to show you this clip in just a moment. This is uh, an example of, um, here we're showing autonomy as a metalinguistic reference. And the person here is going to mention a few different sign names. She's going to mention her own sign name, but then also you'll see references to some other sign names as well. The video is captioned. The white text is the comments from the interpreter and the yellow text are comments from the hearing man in the uh, image. I want to encourage you to really look at how the interpreter is managing each of these uh, references to names. Sharon, the spelling of autonomy is A-U-T-O-N-Y-M-Y. -Y. Thanks.
You see here that the interpreter is using a number of different strategies. She's explaining what names, name signs look like at the same time she's copying the name sign. We're going to show you this one more time because we want to make sure that you're seeing all of the different strategies that this interpreter is choosing to use here. So those references to the name signs are all examples of autonomy. What we're going to do next here is we're going to have Brenda come up and give us an example of the discourse strategy. If you don't mind me adding a quick story. Hello, Linda. It's a little bit funny because the three of us, or actually the four of us, worked together in developing the script for this and the thing about name signs came up but even before that with Linda's name sign <laughs> she's looking at Mark when he said oh everyone has the name, same name sign right she's looking at him like he's an idiot because he does know sign language so it's interesting so she thought even at the time why are you asking me that even within this semi-scripted discussion anyway we thought that was funny So that said, the next example is short, just 20 seconds. So remember with discourse as a reference, that means when a person refers to something that they have said previously within the dialogue, like if you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours, and later saying some backs are itchier than others. In this, Mark references something and then states something else about it. And then the interpreter, Adam, needs to make decisions on what to do about that second reference. So it's not about looking at a failure, it's looking about looking at a strategy, trying to get Linda's attention in that moment, and then making a strategic decision to drop that second piece. Let's take a look, and again, we'll see it two times so you can see where the reference appears. Wow, that's night and day. Like, I'm sorry, not to idioms, but that is really nice. So now you see the background has just been uh, selected. <coughs> yeah. So you can see one of the challenges there. First, Mark says, oh, sorry, I'm not supposed to use idioms. And he's saying that basically to Adam as the interpreter. But then Adam is also in the position then of trying to convey that information to Linda of what Mark has just said. And he does that by trying to get Linda's attention because she's turned away to the computer. So Adam tries for a moment or two to get her attention and then in the moment decides it's not worth pursuing, right? I mean, that's a strategy that we've all seen. Don't want, to think, don't want her thinking Mark's too stupid, but, you know, here we go. So let's take another look at this. Wow, that's nice and dead. Like, I, I'm sorry, not so stupid, but that is really nice. So now you see the background has been uh, selected.
So Adam's solution or his uh, decision in the moment is what you just saw. The third clip we're going to show you, I'm going to have, uh, hand over to Julia to talk with you about. It's a, looking at multiple strategies being employed simultaneously by the interpreter. Now we'll see what the interpreter does within discourse when metalinguistic issues arise. So we've seen with discourse and autonomy thus far, now let's see what happens when both of them arise at the same time. Any other questions you have? No, I think I'm good. Today's been really nice to me. I think I've learned you know, some of the basic stuff, and I'm sure, I think maybe again next week, we'll kind of get more into nitty gritty. Um, and then after that, what's the site for nitty gritty too? Well, the details that we'll expand on, you can say it that way, or the little things, the little details. Like, as an example, I was just showing you how to frame and using those tools. So you could say that, like, expanding on those little details. And that's stuff that we'll be getting into later. So Mark uses an idiom here. He says nitty gritty. And the interpreter makes a decision within the interpretation and thinks we've passed that one by. But then Mark says, oh, how did you sign nitty gritty? Which takes us back to, for the interpreter, what the initial choice was. And then as you see, Adam spells nitty gritty and continues. We're gonna see that one more time. Any other questions you have? No, I think I'm good. Today's been really nice to me. I think I've learned, you know, some of the basic stuff. And I'm sure, I think maybe again next week we'll kind of get more into nitty gritty. Um, and then after that, what's the site for nitty gritty too? Well, the details that we'll expand on, you can say it that way, or the little things, the little details. Like, as an example, I was just showing you how to frame and using those tools. So you could say that, like, expanding on those little details. And that's stuff that we'll be getting into later. So now we see, in a dialogic setting, how the interpreter manages this environment. Let's talk about the results that we found. So in the first setting, monologic, we saw three or four strategies emerge. But now we see some new strategies emerging in the dialogic setting. We have word as a strategy. That's related to the fact that the interpreter is working between a spoken English and sign language, a hearing person and a deaf person in a dialogue mode. So the word, the particular word may come up. Then meta language is also up here, which means a technical term related to linguistics like handshape for a description, for example. There were two types of pointing that we identified in a dialogic setting. One, pointing at a sign, or pointing at an object, excuse me, much as we saw in the PowerPoint for the monologic setting, or pointing at an object in this case, which was the computer. But also pointing at a sign that's being used by the deaf person within their utterance. So pointing at that particular piece of uh, language as it emerges. And then, as we saw in the monologic setting, we saw multiples. But they're slightly different in their combination in this setting. So let's 
take a look at the numbers first. As you may recall in the monologic setting, the interpreters showed a marked preference for finger spelling or showing an equivalent sign for a particular concept. In the dialogic setting, we see a difference. We see a marked use of multiple strategies being employed. So let's take a further look at what those multiple strategies look like. If you recall, we had three double strategies in the monologic setting in varying combinations. Now we have more than that. The interpreter has more possible combinations of strategies that can be employed. In terms of double strategies, we saw fingerspelling, use of a word with a sign, because again it's a dialogue between the hearing person using English and a deaf person using sign language, a word and a sign at the same time, so these are the double combinations that we used, but we also have some further combinations that arose. In a dialogic setting, interpreters use combinations of three strategies at a time. So word, finger spelling and signing, or pointing and signing and describing at the same time. Let's look at which one was used most often. As we can see, a sign with a description was the most often employed strategy. For can, as so when the deaf person modeled a particular sign in ASL, the interpreter could give a word for that and a sign. So to describe it and sign it and that was the most frequently appearing for the English translation. So again, for the monologic setting, we saw fingerspelling as the most predominant strategy used, but in the dialogic setting, we saw different and uh, varying combinations of strategies used to handle metalinguistic references. So not only additional strategies, but additional combinations thereof. So, in sum, let's see what we learned here. So it should be noted that we used seasoned interpreters here, not novice interpreters, because seasoned interpreters have far greater range of strategies available to them in their work. So we, all, we looked at similar strategies that arose within those interpretations of these seasoned interpreters and their strategies were similar. Our study suggests that when we look at monologic strategies and dialogic strategies, that there are more strategies available, they are more diverse and more in dialogic. <coughs> now, we also recognize that we have not identified all of the strategies that are available. Uh, in the next four interpreters that we look at, uh, we might be able to identify other strategies that we have not yet identified to this point.
So where dialogic interpreting is concerned, where there are two people with two different languages happening, the interpreter can render two languages at the same time in what's called co-blending. So they may use the sign for computer while they say computer, for example. And as I said, that is what we refer to as code blending, which is a strategy for dialogic settings. So the goal of our discussion today was for you to leave with an additional skill in your toolkit. So maybe by now you have noticed how frequently metalinguistic references appear in language and in our professional practice. And I think it should be emphasized that we, we do a very hard job and we do it well because we have not only two separate languages but two separate modalities to deal with within our particular scope. I think the three of us certainly agree that we are language learners for life and so as we continue along our professional journey we are still incorporating new skills and new information. So when a challenge arises it can be studied and in this example categorized, learned and then taught overtly. So when we teach these strategies interpreters are able to contemplate the, the strategies that are available to them in managing a particular environment. So we think this has applications for future study. We realize we've only scratched the surface. This is only one year's worth of study and I know I'm a little bit of a nerd but nonetheless I love that part of it. So that's where we're at at this stage. So thank you for your time and attention and at this point we'll hand it over to Dr. Dively for her response and then open the floor to questions. I so enjoyed your presentation on metalinguistic references. I know that this is a difficult topic to uh, discuss. And looking at those two environments, the monologic environment and also the dialogic environment, and looking at how interpreters respond in those two settings, your data collection on the strategies and how interpreters respond to those metalinguistic references is really fine work. So in looking at these two environments, uh, in this particular monologic si situation, you had both deaf and hearing people in the audience. And in the dialogic setting, you had a computer training uh, session. And again, you saw there that more strategies were implemented. I wonder how much content may have influenced those uh, choices and or strategies, such as choosing to fingerspell and or point and what have you. Um, in the more formal setting, in a K through 12 setting, uh, perhaps, uh, as you say, less uh, multiple types of strategies were utilized. So what this leads me to wonder is in the, uh, am I right, in the monologic setting, you had two interpreters, am I right? Okay. So yes, thank you for the question. It was a team of interpreters. So there were two interpreters present but only one did the English to ASL work. So later you also hear an interpreter doing ASL into English when the presenter switches to American Sign Language. But what we have coded at this stage is the one interpreter on screen. So my question really was, was a team present for the interpreter who we see in that image? So we believe so. We believe that there was an interpreter there to support the working interpreter, but you don't see that second interpreter in the video. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Okay, so in the monologic setting, when she chose to uh, present in ASL, 
How did that switch happen? That interpreter would sit down and then start interpreting into English, is that correct? Yes, go to support her colleague. Okay. So there probably were two interpreters there. We can determine that. In the second study, in your dialogic setting, uh, with this kind of tutorial, uh, as, as you, uh, if you will, uh, and then you have multiple people coming in, but you have the same actors and ten interpreters, though. Okay, so, uh, you know, I, I think about those differences and how they might uh, be significant. My point is, is that um, how interpreters respond are dependent on so many things, and not so much whether it's dialogic or monologic. Um, so that's my question for us to ponder. So in the tutorial setting, in the dialogic setting as opposed to the monologic setting, you have, again, you have more maybe bilingual people, more people who know ASL, and maybe the interpreters, because of that, feel more comfortable utilizing fingerspelling as a strategy, uh, especially in that setting. And, um, and here they're talking about interpreting for children. And you know, they often refer to fingerspelling being good for that or not good for that, and how it Im impacts reading and writing. So I was wondering about how all of that might have influenced the decisions there about the interpreter. And what if it's a deaf person from another country and the impact there as well in terms of using fingerspelling? They wouldn't be able to catch that. And if that's the case, what other strategies might be employed if we knew that that wasn't one that would be effective in that environment? Again, this is all just kind of food for thought, something for us to consider uh, in terms of the, the research that you've presented to us. Again, content should be considered, and whether it's dialogic or monologic, but also I think that there are other factors that might uh, determine the strategies that they may use to respond to metalinguistic references. Uh, I do have a question. Actually, do you mind if I add something? You're right in that sometimes uh, there's dangers in giving out information of a study like this because we don't necessarily know how these strategies apply in particular scenarios yet because they are so heavily contextually dependent, as you've said, Dr. Dively. So it very much depends on the setting, the speaker, the interpreters, how they're working together. If it's a child and you're working in a classroom, whether you can physically tap the child to get their attention, etc. All of those different elements are other strategies that might be employed. So I think that Mark, Julia and myself certainly noticed that there are potentially more strategies that could be used like eye gaze or uh, getting someone's attention in particular ways. So if I want Mark to look at me, I can tap him on the shoulder if I can reach him. Or when it's time to look to him, I can physically make eye contact with him, etc. So there are other strategies, and as you've said, Dr. Darvey, that are some formal and some informal that are contextually dependent. So there is room for further exploration. And uh, we'll be looking hopefully at a study on deaf interpreters and on deaf and hearing teams of interpreters and how they manage strategies. So looking at what those strategies might be, how information is given when there is a team of interpreters who use different languages and the potential further complications in that kind of setting. So stay tuned for that coming research. I do have one more question and then I'll open it up for the, to the rest of you. Um, what could you say to interpreters who are training and studying uh, and how could they become more proficient in handling metalinguistic references? We all know how important it is for us to continue to study our work. And we need to study linguistics as it is an element of language and discourse because that is a piece of our work too. It's important that we understand this, that we understand the metalinguistic references so that we can develop the tools and strategies to address them in our interpretation. So this is why we believe it's important. We believe it's important to overtly teach that these things occur and that there are strategies that are available to interpreters to address them.
Did you want to add to that? No, I think you answered that nicely, Mark. Okay, thank you, Mark. Uh, with that, I'm not quite sure who's leading the next section. Oh, okay. Uh, if you do have questions, please come up. We're opening the floor for any of you. This is your chance. Yeah, no one has any experience in this particular situation, do they? Maybe we have a metalinguistic problem right here. Uh, seeing no questions. Again, let me just say thank you to you all for your time and attention, and I believe Dr. Collins has some concluding remarks. Okay, we've come to an end of the presentation. Thank you so much, Dr. Val Dively, and thank you to our three presenters and to everybody who has supported our endeavors today. Um, thank you all of the sponsors who have donated, and I will be seeing you in the spring for our next sessions. And uh, I want to invite the students and also our department faculty to our reception in the second floor cafeteria. You all have a good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here.